Well, we are, of course, doing the Beatitudes. There are, as we've mentioned, eight. <clears throat> the first four deal with uh, a lot with inward qualities, uh, attitudes, whereas the last four tend to deal a little bit more with what those attitudes produce. And tonight we're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. <clears throat> and it said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. <clears throat> I think there's... A, I've already mentioned this more than once in the past few weeks. I think there's a, there's a definite order to them. I think Jesus gave these... Uh, in this particular order for a reason. I don't think it was haphazard. I think he had a, a plan that there is a, some sort of natural progression as we go through these uh, Beatitudes. I mentioned the first four have a lot to do with attitude. The last four have a little more to do with action. So we've got, we've got some inner principles that guide us and then we have some actions that are the result of having those particular attitudes <clears throat> we've talked about the poor in spirit being absolutely essential before the other seven you might say come along in other words, you must empty yourself that we've talked about. You must empty yourself of your own spirit, your own self-will, your own self-desires uh, to allow God to direct your heart. And that, that has to come first. And then these others can progress. But uh, until you're poor in spirit, you really can't have these other attitudes and principles in your life. You must first empty yourself. So that is, um, it's critical. So, first of all, what is mercy? Well, mercy and grace certainly have a relationship. They're not the same, but they do have a, a relationship. Here's some definitions from various Greek uh, dictionaries. Grace is, this is from Thayer's Greek English Lexicon. Grace is kindness which bestows upon one what he has not deserved. You know, God grants us forgiveness by his grace. We in no way deserve it. There's, there's nothing about us, regardless of how many good deeds we do, that causes God uh, to uh, forgive us based on how good we are, but it's because of His grace. Mercy, on the other hand, <clears throat> this is from Goodrich Kohlenberger and Swanson's uh, Greek to English Dictionary, mercy is the moral quality of feeling compassion and especially of showing kindness towards someone in need. This can refer to a human kindness and or to God's kindness to humankind. <clears throat> the best definition of the two that I've encountered is this. Grace is especially associated with men in their sins. And mercy is especially associated with men in their misery. So they both show compassion and they both show concern. They both show love. Grace has more to do with showing compassion when someone is in, their, in sin. And the other one... When someone's in misery, when someone's miserable, um, grace looks down upon sin as a whole. Mercy looks especially upon the miserable consequences of sin. So that mercy really means a sense of pity plus a desire to relieve the suffering. When we're merciful, we see someone's pain and suffering. We see uh, that they're in uh, misery. We see that they're in need. And we have a desire to do something about it. Okay? We, we, we see someone that's in that condition 
and we want to somehow help, want to somehow relieve that suffering, that difficulty uh, that they're going through. <clears throat> Sometimes mercy is said to be grace in action. Mercy is, a, uh, is, uh, is an action. There's something that we do. We're, we're trying to help somebody. When we're merciful, we're trying to help somebody with something. Okay? So we, uh, you, you have to have kindness to show mercy. You have to know compassion to show mercy. You have to have that uh, idea of being sympathetic to show mercy. All of those things uh, are uh, quite important. When we go to Luke chapter 10, we see something there that I think fits right in. Luke chapter 10. Uh, there it is beginning in verse 25 it says and behold a certain lawyer stood up and tested him talking about Jesus tested Jesus saying teacher what shall I do to inherit eternal life so this is Luke 10 verse 25 he said to him what's written in the law what is your reading of it so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So there's that inner feeling that you have to have. That compassion, the sympathy, the concern, the kindness. So, but that compassion led him to do something. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. He who showed mercy. So mercy isn't just something that you feel on the inside. It's something that you show. It's an action. It's something that you do. When you can help, you do that. The priest and the Levite, they might have had some, uh, some feelings for the person that was hurt, but it didn't cause them to do anything about it. That's all they might have had were some feelings, and that was it. So they just went on their way. No, no mercy whatsoever. So he showed mercy. So mercy is, a, is, a, is an action. It's something that we need to do and show for people. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> it says, in the third beatitude, the one we studied a couple weeks ago, we saw that the meek acknowledge their sins before God. Now we see that those who know they are sinners are merciful and have compassion on others, for they are sinners too. He says back in our uh, beatitude, those who are merciful will receive mercy. Will receive mercy. Oh, I went too far. They shall obtain it. 
But you have to be merciful to obtain mercy. So, just like if we want forgiveness from God, what do we have to do? We have to be willing to forgive other people. So that's the same thing he show, he's saying here. If we want God to show us mercy, we have to be willing to show mercy to other people. Our attitude is critical. But it's not just about having an attitude. We have to have an attitude, a heart, a mindset that's willing to do what we can. See, that's what the Good Samaritan did. That's what the merciful do. They do what they can. Which means we are to have genuine compassion. The people, the world needs to see that we're compassionate people, that we actually care when people are hurting, when they're suffering, when they're undergoing difficult times. No, can't help everybody. Uh, nobody can. But it's about helping the person that you can help, whoever that is. Uh, so, to all people, we certainly don't want to be like the priest and the Levite. You know, they might have had. A little bit of pity, but the pity didn't uh, extend to showing mercy. <clears throat> I told you it wasn't going to last long. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I don't think we need to get the idea that by showing mercy to others that somehow forces God to show us mercy. It's not some sort of, you know, checks and balances type of thing. But I think we we have to understand that's part of, of who we are and what we're to do. <clears throat> A lot of times people don't think that those who show compassion are happy, but I think they are. I think people that show compassion for others are happy people. Uh, I think there's a there's something, I don't know if you want to say good, uh, that uh, is in them, but I think there's something there. I think there's there's something that's really important about, about showing mercy to other people. Um, way back in the Old Testament, Let's turn back to Micah for a minute. Comes right after. <clears throat> whoops, I missed it. See, I was saying it comes right after and I missed it. Went right by it. My pages are really stuck. Come on, pages. That went. I should have already opened it up. Okay, it's on page 1075. There it finally is. Micah 6, verse 8. If someone would uh, read that for us. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Do uh, but to justify, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Okay. Love mercy. To love mercy. I want to read something that uh, uh, Barnes wrote, the guy that wrote Barnes Notes on the New Testament. He has some great words about this, this idea of mercy. He says, Nowhere do we imitate God more than in showing mercy. In nothing does God more delight than in the exercise of mercy. To us guilty sinners, to us wretched, dying, and exposed to eternal woe, He has shown His mercy by giving His Son to die for us, by expressing His willingness to pardon and save us, and by sending His Spirit to renew and sanctify the heart. Each day of our life, each hour, and each moment, we partake of His undeserved mercy. 
All the blessings we enjoy are proofs of His mercy. If we also show mercy to the poor, the wretched, the guilty, it shows that we're like God. We have His Spirit and shall not lose our reward. And we have abundant opportunity to do it. Our world is full of guilt and woe, which we may help to relieve. And every day of our lives, we have opportunity by helping the poor and the wretched and by forgiving those who injure us to show that we are like God. I love that. Remember the first time I read that. I, I, I want to read that to you all because it is so, so true. It is just so good about what mercy is all about. Uh, we need to grant mercy. We need to be merciful people. <clears throat> we also, the Bible says, the very next beatitude, we need to be pure in heart. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. He says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. So this beatitude holds the promise of actually seeing God. But he says, Blessed are the pure in heart. In heart. Of course, this is in the Greek language, this is the word cardia. Of course, we get all those good heart terms today cardiac arrest and all those other terms we don't like to hear about but it comes from the same word but in scripture it tends to talk about the seed of our our attitudes the center of our personality our will our emotions our feelings all of that kind of wrapped up into one so kind of the the seat of who we are as an individual. So that includes our will and our feelings, our emotions, uh, our reasoning, all of that wrapped up into one. And he says, we need to be pure in heart. The Bible says we speak out of the abundance of the heart, don't we? Whatever's in our heart, that's what comes out. Um... Remember in Jesus, his talk to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, he also included the scribes in there. He talked about the opposite of being pure in heart. Because the Pharisees, he said, were just all about the outside. And he said, you first got to go clean up what's on the inside. You got to clean it up. Because with the Pharisees, it was dirty. And he said, outwardly you uh, appear to be clean, kind of like a whitewashed tomb, he said, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. Full of corruption, full of decay, full of immorality, full of evil. So they were full of hypocrisy. So all kinds of, of darkness on the inside, but they wanted people to think they were uh light but they weren't so he said you need to be pure in heart pure comes from a Greek word <clears throat> that basically means to make pure by cleansing from dirt filth contamination <clears throat> a cleansing of the mind a cleansing of the emotions that's what we need to do <clears throat> this denotes someone who loves God with all of his heart just like we read a minute ago. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind. Undivided loyalty. So we need to be pure. We need to be clean. Moral cleanness. Certainly our society today is similar to the society in the first century. You know, Roman society, Corinthian society, they were really corrupt. And there's a lot of ways that our society today is very similar uh, to uh, first century Roman society, first century Corinthian society. A very immoral, very vulgar, very ungodly, and very similar attitudes in, in a lot of ways. So there's, there's some similarities there. But in both of those cases... God wanted Christians to go into those places and try and change that society. Try and change it. 
And one of the ways, of course, they did that was by being pure in heart. Holiness is being pure in heart. You know, cleanse, cleanse yourselves of, of all defilement of the flesh, the Bible tells us. Difficult to do, but necessary to do. And he says, if you don't do it, you cannot see God. Because he says, it's the pure in heart that will get to see God. Get to be in God's presence. If I have a pure heart, then I'm going to be loyal to God. I'm going to be loyal to doing what's right. I'm going to be loyal to that. When are we going to see God? Well, in a sense, we can see Him a little bit in our world. You know, when we, when we see people trying to live a godly life, we're kind of seeing a partial uh, part of God. Um, when we see parts of nature, we can see a part of God in a sense when we do those things because those things give evidence of God's creation. How much He cares for us. Uh, we can see Him in history. You know, when you look at the whole plan of redemption that God put in place all the way back to Genesis and all the things that He did through history to ensure that Jesus was born in Bethlehem when He was born. All the things that happened. And a lot of times when you look at that whole history, it came down to one person. One person was all that was left. Or it wouldn't have worked out. But it worked out. And so we see God throughout all of those thousands of years making sure that Jesus came into the world there in the first century and lived and died and rose from the dead. That's an amazing study. But we see Him in all of those things. And then, of course, finally... We will see him ultimately in heaven. Let's go to First John chapter three, first of all. First John chapter three, and if someone would read verse two, and then we'll go to Revelation twenty two. First John chapter 3, verse 2, if someone will read that. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet that we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. Okay, we don't fully understand exactly what we're going to look like, or how we're going to be, or even what He's going to look like until then. But we do know we shall be like Him. We shall be like Him. It's not the only place the Bible says we will be like Him. There there are certain aspects of us that we will be similar to Him. Now, let's go to Revelation 22. And if someone would now read, let's see, Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Okay, his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. This, of course, is talking about a picture of heaven, what it's going to be like. But what do we have to do to be able to see that? Well, the writer of Hebrews wrote this in Hebrews chapter 12. This will be our last verse for the night. Hebrews chapter 12, and I believe it's verse 14. Yeah, if someone would read that now. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. For 
pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Okay. Pursue. That means some efforts involved, right? To pursue peace with all people, that's sometimes pretty hard to do. That's why we have kind of a strong action verb there. Pursue peace. But we also have to pursue holiness or sanctification. We have to pursue it. Holiness doesn't just fall on us. It's something we have to pursue and go after. We, you know, we live in a very unholy society. So if we don't pursue holiness, we're certainly not going to get it from our society. Our society is about as unholy as you can get. So we're not going to get holiness from our culture, from our society. We have to pursue it. All right. So only those people who pursue peace and pursue holiness, he says, will be able to see the Lord. Will be able to see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All right. I think that's probably a good place to stop tonight. Lord willing, we will.